Welcome to In Focus with Eden Lane. Hi, I'm Eden Lane. Tonight we're at the Bug Theater to meet with John Moore to find out about the projects he's doing for his arts and culture website, culturewest.org. We'll begin with the photo essay of opening night photos that he's begun at the beginning of this year and find out about the rest of the projects he's working on. Since leaving the Denver Post more than a year ago, John Moore has been as busy and productive as ever, and founding Culture West is just a part of it. We've been watching the on culturewest.org this really great photo essay series you started at the beginning beginning of the year, mm -hmm. um, opening nights. Right. How did you come up with that idea? Well, I'm constantly looking for new ways of covering theater that have never been tried before. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd taken some photos in the past year or so that just were very random photos backstage at various shows. And they, they, they showed a side of the actors that the audience never gets to see, that moment of quiet reflection or a group in a circle backstage. Or the red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I thought that it would be an opportunity to further humanize the actors by by showing people um, one iconic shot from backstage at every show that I go see in 2013. Or at so least when you started, that. it was with the idea that this would be a, a full series. Right. Because wasn't RFK the first mm -hmm. one in the series? It was. That was an iconic image that you were able to capture for that show. This, the actor sitting at his, at his, at his mirror mm -hmm. contemplating before opening up, yeah. As you're doing this, of course, they're all getting used to the idea that you're going to be backstage yes. at opening night. Yes, yes, they are. <laughs> <laughs> that, that must be kind of difficult, though, to be inobtrusive with so much going on. Well, when I first started it, I said, I want to be a fly on the wall. I don't want to set anything up. Everything's going to be completely candid. And every response I got was some variation of the fact that you will be the largest fly on the wall <laughs> since Jeff Goldblum in the movie The Fly. Because it's you and a camera. <laughs> yeah, they're like, tell, yeah, try telling my cast to ignore the fact that John Moore is sitting in, the, in their dressing room while they're getting undressed. Um, <laughs> so at, at the beginning, I, uh, people didn't know really what to make of it, but, but uh, people under, understand and appreciate the intent, which is to bring awareness to all these shows as they're happening as well. And so people have been incredibly welcoming. And now that I'm rolling out the photos as we go, people can kind of see where I'm going with them. But uh, but you're right. Now now people see me and and you know it's sort of like a, a Friday night at a party. People are like posing and you know and they're making for great photos. But they're, I, I want to keep to the to the concept that these are quiet moments. So how do you do that? Because it is natural, especially for actors, to want to manage their image in some way, if not right out pose. How do you? I really truly just try to be as inobtrusive as possible and when people first see that I'm in there of course they're they're very friendly everybody in the theater community is so welcoming and so you have this moment where it's you, you get caught up and then it's like okay you go do your thing and then you you really do try to blend in and and the best pictures I think are those when they're not necessarily aware that you're shooting them at that particular moment and those turn out to be the best pictures I think. What kind of equipment are you using? Is it a traditional DSLR so that we hear the click and or is it yeah, I was afraid you were going to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because it, back in 2005 when I was working at the Denver Post, that was when we truly became a multimedia news staff and we were all given cameras and audio recorders and um, and we were told to videotape everything. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I've, I've, I would never call myself a professional photographer. I have way too much respect for people who truly are professional photographers to do that. But we've gotten an, a, a great deal of experience over the last eight years just covering events just for- Just the nature the, of the change, the way the business has changed, you have right. to take your own photos in many cases. Right, right. But I'm also a, a, a regrettably unemployed journalist at the moment, <laughs> and I don't have my own equipment. So I have become the, you know, like the guy in the street corner saying, you know, would you lend me your camera for a month? And I'm trying, <laughs> I'm using a lot of different cameras and it's out of the generosity of different people's hearts. So sometimes you might have a DSLR where we're hearing the click and we see that it's a real camera and then you might be using something less obtrusive. Yeah, I, I originally was hoping to do it all as sort of Instagram photos. Mm -hmm. um, I did an entire photo project for the Denver Post called 30 Parks in 30 Days. And the, yeah. the, using, using the, that cell phone technology can turn out some amazing photographs if that's the way you want to go. But I'm really trying to make this a little bit uh, distinct and so. Well, one um, distinct feature of it is so far, if I'm not mistaken, they're all in black and white. With one exception so Which far. Which is? Um, the production of Red, 
by Theater Works in Colorado Springs because there was four buckets of red paint, and it was. I, I thought it would be nice for if you're looking through the series online to to see black and white, black and white, and then be struck hopefully mm -hmm. by one one color image where it really actually works for that. But I'm going to tell you a secret because. The fact of the matter is, uh, the real photographers will tell you this too, black and white photography will cover up for a lot of amateur <laughs> f photography mistakes. So sometimes you're looking at a picture and uh, honestly, it just looks ordinary in color and you convert it to black and white and suddenly it looks very vintage. It looks very old school and almost like you intended it to. So the first couple ones, <laughs> I was like, my light settings are off. Uh, you know, I, I'm mm -hmm. just going to make a fool of myself. But you convert it to black and white, and you, can fi you can fix just about anything. <laughs> so after a, a couple of them, I was just sitting there going, some of the some of the lighting situations that you're shooting in backstage are very dark. Right, because you can't, if right. you're trying to be that fly on the wall, you can't bring in right. lighting to augment right. what's there. And you don't want to just be flashing in people's faces backstage. They have a job to do, and they need to focus and concentrate on the work at hand. So uh, you want to use flashes minimally, uh, minimally, minimally, mm -hmm. minimally <laughs> as possible. And, um, and that means that uh, sometimes you, you've got to go with some really low light settings. And there are expert photographers who know how to handle that situation much better than I do. But um, black and white is my best friend. It, it, it also sets up a whole tone in terms of the viewer mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's very formal in many yeah. ways. Yeah. Was that part of the intent? I think so. I, I think it adds, you know, it's easy for me to say. I, I, I hope it adds a, a, touch of, a touch of class, a touch of nostalgia, yeah. in a sense. Um, but I like the fact that actors are also inherently silly people. And some of my favorite shots are when they're just being ridiculous backstage and you just get them at, right at that moment. Um, where you bring out some of the joy that's going on, the mm -hmm. energy building that's going on backstage when they're doing a comedy. So, um, so I hope it's a wide variety of kind of emotional intent. When you're uh, approaching companies early on in the process that you wanted to include their opening night in this mm -hmm. essay, what was their reaction then? When every, just with, with only one exception, every theater company has said, we don't know what you're doing, but, but if you're going to give us some publicity, please come. <laughs> and I really can appreciate that. It's hard that. for them now. But I have relationships with all these companies that go back all of these years. So they know that, I, that, that whatever it was that I was talking about, that they know I had their best interests at, at heart. Um, but most of it was sort of like, that sounds fun. <laughs> and, but then what my process has been is I've gone and I've tried to just find the one iconic shot that I can include in the series. Because but, you do more than one image for each opening. R right. Well, when they allow you an hour of access, you know, you come out of it with hundreds of shots. And, and I was noticing I was having all these, these pretty good photos that weren't necessarily going to make it into the series. So I've started on a regular basis putting up one blog entry per night. So. Um, for mm -hmm. example, I'm going to be coming back for the reopening of Bat Boy on Friday night, and <clears throat> and there will be a shot that goes in the series, and then there will be a collection that are specific to to that particular show, and that helps sort of justify in the theater company's yeah. minds. You know, they they get something out of it that they can put out there and say, hey, this is something different. Take a look at what our show looks like backstage, and trying to capture the. Um, the, 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 the sort of unique moments that also only happen on opening nights. What's that editing process for you when you get back and you have a hundred shots to yeah. get through? Well, as a word guy, I, I agonize over every word. As a photo editor, I'm brutal. <laughs> <laughs> in I mean, brutal in just, what way? Oh, you just, you just throw stuff away. Yeah. yeah. You, you're, you're trying to find 20 good shots. It's, it's, it's a lot. To, for me, it's a lot easier to what edit. What makes for. a good shot for you then for in these backstage? You, if I'm the one who's shot it, if it makes me stop for two seconds and say, what are the expressions on those faces? What is that conveying? Did you get everybody's, you know, in a group shot, is everybody half turned or, you know, mm -hmm. you, you just know. I mean, it's, it's just like, why does anybody stop on a photo? So the regular things, the composition, the subject matter, right. is there anything that, that you're looking for that specifically connects to that play that they're producing? Oh, sometimes. I try not to go into any shoot with a preconceived idea of what that shot is going to be. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's really relevant to the, to, the, to the work being done. And sometimes it's just relevant to um, what pleases the eye. You know, it's a funny thing about photography. We, we were always handed studies when I was working at the Denver Post about how much time readers actually stop and spend time on a story, a photo. You know, mm -hmm. for photographers, I have nothing but respect for photographers. but. Research shows that if you've really, if you've really captured somebody's attention, 
with a photo in the newspaper, the average person will stop and look at that photo for between six and seven seconds. And if you get their attention for six or seven seconds, then you've really scored. And mm -hmm. I just think that's incredible because sometimes real photographers are spending hours, days, weeks setting up that one perfect shot. That's right. And an artist in a gallery, you know, I'm sure that, <laughs> I'm sure that they look at it painting on the wall a little bit longer, but it is, it is kind of a different way of looking at it and saying, wow, you've really, you've, you've really captured their attention if you can hold their attention for six seconds. How is it different for you to go from telling the story mm -hmm. with words to almost telling the entire story with the image? I mean, yeah. you are enhancing your post of the image right. with some words, but right. really the focus is the image. It's completely revitalizing because I think that my, my form will, will always be the written word. Mm -hmm. Um, but I love telling stories in as many different forms as you possibly can through video podcasts. My, my video series on Shelley Bordas is a combination mm -hmm. of, of the written word but narrated for video. That's your um, second or third little documentary series that you've yeah. done for Culture West. And I'm, you know, I'm having a period of my, my career where I can experiment with all of these different kinds of storytelling techniques. And the, the thing about a given story is, you know, 10 years ago, if you were a writer, you wrote a story. If you were a photographer, you did a photo essay. Mm -hmm. If you're a videographer, well, we didn't really have those 10 years ago. Right. Now, you can approach any particular story and say, is this a, is this a written story? Is this a photo essay? Is this a video? Or um, all of them. All of them. And actually, one of the great things about this project that I never really expected was in spending more intimate time with the companies, um, you discover s stories that are unfolding backstage that you never would have had access to before. Um, some of them are really significant stories, like by keeping in touch with the people at Heritage Square Music Hall, making my appointment right. is how I discovered that this, this great 25-year institution is going to be closing at the end of the year. Um, the other night I was shooting at uh, the University of Denver, their student production of Fiddler on the Roof, mm -hmm. starring the multi-award winning John Arp. And I was taking shots in the um, dressing room and I know they said, oh, you have to see our Fruma Sarah. She's a, she's a blind actress. I knew exactly who she, she was. It's Sam Barrasso from Family. And I've seen her perform a number of different times uh, in family productions. And it's fantastic to see her in a DU production. But I wouldn't have known that this family actor was, was in this production if I hadn't have, have been there. Um, when I was doing a production of Out of Order in Breckenridge, um, I noticed that, it, that an actor was icing his leg, and I said, oh, just sprain your ankle. And he's like, no, I fractured it in three places. I said, when did you do that? And he's like, two days ago. And I said, but you just did the show. And he's like, yeah, and, and you just sit there with sort of awe and amazement. But, you know, that's the kind of thing that even as a critic, you would, you know, you would never know those, those little backstage things were going on unless you spend some time with them. You mentioned that you most of these companies already have a relationship with you for many years because mm -hmm. you were the theater reporter and critic for the Denver Post, but now you're you're getting a kind of access that you wouldn't have had as right. the critic. It would have How's been How's it changing your relationship with the companies and the actors? Well, it's really funny. Eden. All I had to do was quit to find out how much I was loved. <laughs> Because I thought I was hated. <laughs> I mean, it's really, it's really funny. There's a we've talked about this before. There is a necessary um, level of antagonism that exists in the relationship between a theater critic and the theater community, and separation. And there, there absolutely should be. And when I took the um, the job buyout at the Denver Post, I, if you had talked to me on that day, I would have said I have a very complicated relationship with the Denver theater community. There are some people who I've established very strong relationships with. Um, and there are other people who are going to be really happy to see me go. And it's funny, once you, once you leave, you know, and the reviews stop. Um, and this new I've, kind of work starts. I've, I've felt a whole lot of love in the last year that I never knew existed. <laughs> you know, and it's been really wonderful. And, and, and the, the key is to stay relevant. I mean, I don't know where my next professional chapter of my life is going to take me. But, uh, but I know that in the meantime, I want to stay relevant. I want to stay creating content. Mm -hmm. And so doing the Shelley Bordas video documentary, doing um, the opportunity to write tributes to people like Adam Perks and Angela Johnson, the actress from uh, northern Colorado who died suddenly in January. Mm -hmm. um, you s th th there is something quite noble about the journalist in all of this. Um, there is the, the, the possibility to do real good work. And 
the cliches and stereotypes about a critic always being out to tear down. I, I fought against those for 10 years and right. I never, and I'm glad not to be writing reviews at the moment. I'm really happy to be creating content like the photo series that just reinforces in people's mind that I'm an advocate and a journalist as well. And with, now somewhat of a documentarian is in many ways. I hope so for the, for the, for the right story. Uh, absolutely. You, you've done a couple of these series. You mentioned the Shelley story. That's the kind of thing that you can only do now because of your rich history of covering the community so that you know these people and you have relationships and where you're going now and the work you're doing on culturewest.org. I hope so and I appreciate you saying that. The, these are the kind of stories that uh, that are a privilege to cover, mm -hmm. and the only reason I'm, I'm sure that I'm given access to people is over the course of time, hopefully establishing uh, mutually respectful relationships, and I hope that that's, uh, that's uh, something I can continue. I know that you're also uh, rejoining the theater community as a director coming up very soon. Why, yes I am. Boy, you have done your homework, <laughs> you intrepid <laughs> Eden Lane. <laughs> you're right. I'm, uh, I'm going to be directing a production of uh, Always Patsy Klein, opening April 12th at the Parker Arts and Culture Events Center, the and, Pace Center. And now we know it's <coughs> going to have the glorious Megan Vandehey as part of that cast. Who else is in it with you? Carla Kaiser Kotrick, who was born to play the role of Louise, the Houston housewife who befriends her. Um, I've been joking for a month about how I didn't realize directing was apparently this easy. <laughs> because they give me a beautiful $23 million arts facility to perform it in. They give me, a, a, you know, the opportunity for, um, to, to consider all of the best actresses in Denver for the roles. Um, a, a dream team. Neil Dunphy from the Boulder Dinner Theater mm -hmm. is taking a leave of absence just to play in our band. Wow. Uh, the entire list of people who have been handed to me by producer Ronnie, Ronnie Gallup is a dream team. Uh, I, I, I couldn't be luckier. How did that even come to you? I mean, did, did you say, I'd like to, what I really want to do is direct. <laughs> well, I directed a number of shows before I became a theater critic. Um, and and I, I've, I've always sort of felt like I was a member of the creative community, but people just, a lot of people didn't know that. Mm -hmm. um, but I just happened to have helped out my former high school director, KQ, who does Magic Moments, Years and years ago, when the Denver Civic Theater was first opening, wow, the studio theater in there was still being constructed. We actually, uh, we actually installed the seats in the Dory Theater for the very first production there. He was doing a production of of uh, Story Theater for a bunch of students from Littleton High School, and Ronnie then Stark was one of those students. And my director called me in and asked me if I would do some character rehearsals with his group, and we just bonded and. We're st so many of the people in that show, and I we're, we're still such close friends. Mm -hmm. And um, and Ronnie now is all grown up, a mother and a producer of theater in in Colorado. And she contacted me, and she just said, "I want to do Always Patsy Klein, and I want you to direct it for me." And I just said, "When do we start?" How does that feel to get back to that part of your well? I really life can't wait. Theater. I really can't wait for the reviews. That. <laughs> I have I've been warned by a few people <laughs> that it's going to be interesting to see how the Colorado critical community takes to the opportunity to respond to my first theatrical effort since leaving my job. I well, actually you were wise enough to insulate to. yourself with uh, the cast that you did. <laughs> I insulated myself with Megan Van de Hey, Carla Kaiser Kotrick, and it's only a two week run, <laughs> so most re most reviewers don't bother with two week two runs. Week so runs. I think I'm. I mean, well, you know, what? I actually really welcome the response because I can't be a hypocrite when I when That's I right. when I told people it's really just dialogue. It really it really is. I can't wait to hear what kind of, what people have to say about this. But I, I keep saying that it's a gateway back to directing. Uh, Ronnie has made this as completely uh, easy as it could possibly be made. But I, I would love to get back to directing. It's just that most people know my sensibilities would think that I would I would be coming back to direct some really intense drama. You know, that eight but people are going to come see. Pro <laughs> who knows? <laughs> who who knows? But I like to do the kind of theater that like eight people want to come see, you know? And in this case... I'd rather be nine people's favorite thing 
than 100 people's exactly. ninth favorite thing. Exactly. But now I'm in a situation where we're doing, we're doing always Pat's a Klein and... Uh, Everyone's going to want to come and see it. Well, I hope so. Uh, the Parker Arts Center is a beautiful facility with 549 seats. So uh, I remember when it was performed at the Gallery of Theater with just over 150 people. And, um, you know, it's quite a challenge to try to, to bring the intimacy of that show onto one of the biggest stages. Yes in Colorado so I'm where I'm, some of your audience is so far removed as but well. that's what's beautiful about the Parker Art Center two things not the front row of seats actually touches the stage mm. and also that that stage actually comes down and so I'm I'm gonna be able to completely eliminate the distance between the stage and the actors in a way that you usually can't in a facility of that of that kind I was kind of blown away when I walked in and was given a tour and said oh we can do that and we can do that this is going to be fun. When do you begin rehearsals? Uh, March 25th. March 25th. We open on April 12th. Yeah. I hope For everybody. Two weeks. Yeah. We have well, six performances only: two on Saturdays, uh, one on Friday, two on Saturdays. And uh, I hope everybody comes and and if they want it, if if they want to have all the revenge on me that they've ever wanted. <laughs> I just hope they have it on me and not on my beautiful actresses. Well, as you said before, be. there's a lot of affection and respect for you in this community. I so I don't so. think there's a whole lot of revenge that will happen. Well, I, I mean, I, I kind of sit back like I'm in the catbird seat because I'm like, if you want to take pot shots at this, my, at this show, you're going to be taking pot shots at Carla Kaiser Kotrick and <laughs> Megan Vandehey. Do so at your own peril, at your own I say. Peril. <laughs> that's, exactly. interesting, that's, that's interesting that you're feeling that way uh, about this re-emerging part of your role in the theater. Yeah. You're, you're also still acting as a journalist and, and a documentarian now mm -hmm. with these series that you're doing, the photo essay. So tell me, um, what is Culture West becoming for you? Well, right now it's keeping me sane. Um, it's a story that's way too long to get into for the purposes of your show, but Cult Culture West started as um, as an idea mm -hmm. for a new arts and media platform in Colorado where we had very big ideas and we were working with the foundation to make this into um, something that was really going to change the game in Colorado. And, and you were going to be working with a few other people at the same time. Right, right. And the, the seeds of this project are actually going to happen and I'm really excited about that. I'm not sure what or whether role I'm going to have in it in mm -hmm. any way. Um, but Culture West was created to be the beta of what that was going to show people. But now it's you. Well, now it, what it does is while I'm still figuring out the next stage of my life, journalistically or, or, or otherwise, it gives me a chance to stay part of the conversation in the mm -hmm. Colorado theater community, which I love so much. You know, every time there's a breaking news story or there's some great show that's going on, um, I love the fact that I still have a way of helping people get the word out about what's what's going on in our, com in our community. It's a it's a it's a role I never really wanted to leave in the first place, um, but I but yet I did it and I took the jump into the chaos and into the void and and it's been a year now it's been the most challenging year of my life and it's a year I would never give back for all of its personal and professional challenges because it's it's in some ways it's been the most interesting year of my life as well. <laughs> I got my first byline in the New York Times. I wrote for a couple magazines. I had some, you know, personal challenges, you know. I ended up in the hospital a couple times and yeah. after after never calling in sick a day in my life for for That's 18 years. That's what you get for years. leaving the newspaper. First time, yeah, <laughs> no kidding. Never calling sick a day in your life and then you can guarantee that you will be you're going to pay for that hubris if you walk away from, from that. So Culture West is still you as a journalist, but it's also you as an artist and a member of the theater community now. So how do you describe yeah. what Culture West is? Well, I hope it's a reflection on just the, ch the changing nature of arts journalism in America, which is changing necessarily because of the economic crisis that most media companies are facing, mm -hmm. um, reduced staffs, reduced... Um, news holes, which in some ways I think out of necessity is creating some of the best journalism that... that um, because the audience or viewer or reader or listener still wants it. They, they still want it, but you have to really decide how best to spend your precious resources mm -hmm. of, in time and, and money. But everything's an opportunity. You know, the Culture West it's, is, is an opportunity every single day to say, 
what what can I do today and I'm not constrained by any of the bounds of the old ways of doing things mm -hmm. and saying well this is the way we've always done it now I'm I'm, a, I'm solo now so um, it may not be the best approach every single time but it's fun to just be able to say every single day is a new is a new challenge and I'm glad for the theater community that I'm uh, that I'm still able in some small much smaller way to stay relevant in the conversation and to help them and expand the kinds of things you're able to do Ex exactly well I'm so glad that you <clears throat> finally agreed to come and tell us about the photo essay series and some of these other components that you're bringing to us on Culture West because I, I think they're quite wonderful and I'm glad to get to thank you share I, it today. I'm, 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 I'm really proud on behalf of the, the theater community for the stories that we're being able to tell both with pictures and with video and occasionally with words and occasionally with words mm -hmm. John brings us a brief look at rehearsals for always Patsy Klein <laughs> Always Patsy Klein plays at the Pace Center for just two weekends. Details are available at parkeronline.org. Ignite Theatre Company has a new production opening in Aurora this week. Ignite Theatre Company's production of Cabaret plays at the Aurora Fox. Details are available at their webpage, ignitetheatre.com. That's all for this edition. Remember to join us on Facebook and Twitter. With all that Colorado has to offer, we're here to help you keep it in focus. Thanks for watching. Good night.